Hey, how you doing, Andre? Man, I only need five minutes of your life. Something just came up and I really need someone to talk to. Man, I lost my job. I'm not sure what's going on. I did everything that I was supposed to do. I said everything that I was supposed to say. The only thing that I could possibly think of is because I'm African American. Bro, I don't really know what's going on right now. I can't really explain it to you. All I know is that it's not fair. I have something to tell you. What's going on? I'm pregnant. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. Can I plan your baby shower? No, there's gonna be nothing to plan. I'm not, not having this baby. But it's a baby, that is so awesome, it's life. No, I can't. Why? I'm 19 years old, I'm in college, I don't have a stable job and I live with my parents. Well, what about your boyfriend, what does he say? I don't care what he thinks, it's my body, I can do whatever so what? I want to. So what, what are you gonna it. do? I'm gonna get an abortion. You can't, that is a baby inside of you, it's life. God made that baby inside it's of you. It's not a baby yet. But you're killing it, that's not fair. Oh, man. ISIS has another hostage that they're about to execute. They're going around killing all these innocent people. Man, it's just not fair. What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. The sun rises and the sun sets, then hurries around to rise again. The wind blows south and then turns north. Around and around it goes, blowing in circles. Rivers run into the sea, but the sea is never full. Then the water returns again to the rivers and flows out again to the sea. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. Everything is meaningless. Completely meaningless. So what's the purpose? I'm sure that you, like me, have seen what is happening in the world today. And at some point, you've sat back and thought, what in the world is going on? Why, what in the world is, is this world coming to? It seems as if the world is filled with injustice. Uh, you watch the news like I do, I'm sure, on a regular basis, and we're reminded of the injustice that takes place around the world. Just this past week, uh, a man in Bell, Florida, 51-year-old man, my age, killed his daughter and his six grandchildren. And as I watched that like you, I thought, what in the world is going on? I'm sure that you have watched like I have as the National Football League is in shambles, as multiple players are found guilty of beating their wives and beating their children. And we sit back and ask, what is going on? Statistics say that every year, 17,000 people in our country are kidnapped and forced into sex trafficking. 50% of those are children. And by the way, Miami, Florida, one of the hubs of sex trafficking in the United States today. And as uh, John mentioned just a few moments ago in the skit, the terrorist organization ISIS is killing children and beheading victims. Uh, quite frankly, this morning, we could go on and on, and we could spend all of our time today discussing the many injustices that are occurring around the world and injustices that are occurring in our own backyard. We, we hear of such tragedies, and, and we we're able now to watch such tragedies on the news, and, uh, and those atrocities provoke questions in our mind, questions that I'm sure you have had. How could God allow these things to happen? How can, how can so many people get away with these atrocities? How should you and I respond to the injustice around us? 
The injustice that maybe transpires in in your life and the injustice that we witness in our community and the injustice that we see that is taking place around the globe. How should we as believers respond to that? Well, in the passage of Scripture that we're looking at today, Solomon addresses injustice. And Solomon admits that injustice occurred during his time, during his reign, and quite frankly, injustice occurs during our lifetime as well. And so, if you have your Bible, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, I'm going to begin reading in verse 16. If you don't have your Bible, we'll put it up on the screen. I do encourage you to bring your Bible and follow along. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 16, Solomon says this, I also notice that under the sun... There is evil in the courtroom. Yes, even the courts of law are corrupt. I said to myself, in due season, God will judge everyone, both good and bad, for all their deeds. I also thought about the human condition, how God proves to people that they are like animals, For people and animals share the same fate. Both breathe and both must die. So people have no real advantage over animals. How meaningless, Solomon says. Both go to the same place. They came from dust and they return to dust. For who can prove that the human spirit goes up and the spirit of animals goes down into the earth? So I saw that there is nothing better for people than to be happy in their work. That is why we are here. No one will bring us back from death to enjoy life after we die. Chapter 4, verse 1. Again, I observed all the oppression that takes place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed with no one to comfort them. The oppressors have great power and their victims are helpless. So I concluded that the dead are better off than the living. But most fortunate of all are those who are not yet born, for they have not seen all of the evil that is done under the sun. Would you pray with me today? Father, uh, all of us today, I'm sure, have thought in our minds and in our hearts of injustices that we have either experienced or injustices that we have witnessed in the lives of others, in our own community, in other communities, in our own country, in other countries around the world. And Father, no doubt at times those injustices have caused questions in our mind, questions as to where you are, God, and questions as to why these things are happening and how we as believers should respond to the many injustices that are taking place. And so, Lord, as we examine life today, and as we examine these verses in Ecclesiastes, Lord, how I pray that that you would drive home some truths to our hearts and to our minds. Help us to realize, God, that you are in control, even though we don't understand what is taking place. Help us to realize that you are in control and help us to trust you this morning. Help us to realize that there's a God in heaven who loves us, desires to have a relationship with us, and is in control of our lives. God, help us to trust him this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Several weeks ago, we we began a journey through the book of Ecclesiastes, and I want to go back, we're four or five weeks into it, I want to go back and kind of review some of the things that we have learned, some of the things that we have studied so far. You'll remember that Ecclesiastes is an Old Testament track, an Old Testament track that examines life not as it was originally created, but examines life in its fallen condition. We're reminded of the fact that we live in a fallen world. We live in a sinful world, and the atrocities that we experience around us are because of the fact that man has fallen. Ecclesiastes talks about that throughout the entire book. Solomon proves that the pursuit of happiness 
through wisdom, pleasure, hard work, and success is futile. He uses the words meaningless and and futile and chasing the wind over and over again in this book. And as we've already seen, he looked for happiness. He looked for satisfaction and pleasure. He looked for it in success. He looked for it in wisdom. He looked for it in all of those areas. Areas, yet every time he came to the conclusion saying, wow, all of that is meaningless. That's not where happiness is found. We've stated that this book is a testimony of the unsaved and the unsurrendered who are chasing after the wrong things. And I'm sure many of us here today could give testimony to the fact that at times in our life, maybe even now, we're chasing after the wrong thing, and that thing, whatever it is, is not giving us the long-term satisfaction, happiness, and meaning to life that we so desperately need. And so we've come to the conclusion that this book points us towards one person. This book points us towards Jesus Christ. And we realize that true happiness is only found through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And even though Jesus is not mentioned in this book, Solomon is is making a case for the fact that life without Jesus is without purpose. Life without Jesus is meaningless. We've said over and over again that God is not near as interested in your happiness as he is in your holiness. And God drives us towards him so that we will become more and more like him. As I've read through this book, and obviously I've read through it several times the last few months trying to prepare my mind and heart, but I am amazed how relevant this book is. This book was written some 3,000 years ago, probably 2,900 and some years ago, and yet this book is just as relevant as if it were written yesterday or today. The, the topics that Solomon deal with, man, jump off of the newspaper, even though most of us don't read a newspaper, or jump off MSN or, or jump off the, the news channel because what Solomon was dealing with, you and I are dealing with today. I don't know, I, I kind of look forward to getting to heaven and sitting down and talking with Solomon because I get what he was going through and I trust that you do too. So so a couple of points as we walk through the passage today. If you'll take your outline, the first point is this. Life is filled with injustice. Life is filled with injustice. Now, remember that Solomon is searching. He's examining. He's evaluating life. His pursuit led him to look for happiness in all the wrong places. And yet as Solomon observed his life and as he observed the life of those around him, he realized that all was not well. First of all, he realized that not everyone was treated equally. Some were treated good, some were treated bad. Some were given certain rights and others had those rights taken away from them. Even in the land of Israel where God's people dwelt, social injustice abounded. And Solomon was shocked by what he saw. I want you to see three observations that, that, that Solomon makes in the passage that, that I believe are really applicable and relevant for us today. The first thing that Solomon says about his day, he says this, there is oppression and there is exploitation by the legal system. There's oppression, the legal system oppress, uh, oppresses. The legal system exploits We read verse 16. Let me read it to you in the ESV. I'll read it in a couple of translations. The ESV translates verse 16 this way. Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness. And in the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. The Living Bible says it this way. Moreover, I noticed that throughout the earth, justice is giving way to crime. Even the police and the courts are corrupt. The New Living Translation says it this way. We read it. I also noticed that under the sun, 
there is evil even in the courtroom. Yes, even the courts of law are corrupt. Here's what evidently had taken place. Evidently, Solomon had gone into the courtroom to watch a trial. Uh, Israel's justice system obviously was different than ours, but they had a, a, an adequate judicial system based upon divine law. But Solomon says even that system that was based upon divine law had been corrupted. If you go to chapter 5 and verse 8 of Ecclesiastes, Solomon says this, don't be surprised if you see a poor person being oppressed by the powerful and if justice is being miscarried throughout the land. Solomon was king, but as he went into the courtrooms, as he mingled among his own people, Solomon was appalled by what was taking place, why the rich and the powerful were oppressing the poor. And those who were supposed to be bringing justice and equity and, uh, and peace in the community were abusing their privileges. Psalm 82 and verse 2, the psalmist says this, how long will you hand down unjust decisions by favoring the wicked? And if you read much of the Old Testament, that went on throughout the nation of Israel. The book of Amos is written exclusively to deal with the injustices of Israel and the injustices of the nations around them. I don't know about you, I read that and I think, wow, we can relate to that in our day and age. Uh, such accusations are commonplace in today's legal system. Now let me first of all say, and I think it's important to say, that some of the finest, most godly, and honest people I know are police officers and those that work in the judicial system. I thank God for their service. Chaos would prevail without those in law enforcement. Yet you and I know, we see it on the news, we experience it, that evidences of police brutality, dishonest judges, and corrupt politicians are increasing. It was taking place during Solomon's day, and it's taking place during our day as well. He mentions a second thing. The second thing that Solomon mentions, the second injustice, he says that innocent people experience pain and sorrow. Jump down to chapter 4 and verse 1. He says, again, I observed all the oppression that takes place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed with no one to comfort them. The oppressors have great power and their victims are helpless. Tragically, it is the strong and powerful that often prey upon the weak. Solomon mentioned that as well. Solomon saw innocent people being oppressed by power-hungry officials. The victims wept, but their tears did no good. I've been in communication with our missionary Mike Rittering in, in Burkina Faso. By the way, Mike has malaria. Put Mike on your prayer list. He's struggling with malaria, but Mike repeatedly shares with us the plight of women and children in East Africa uh, or West Africa. You'll remember when Mike was here just a few months ago, he went through and stated that, that the least of these in the continent of Africa is not even children. The least of these in the continent of Africa are women. They're helpless. They're weak. They are continually preyed upon by those who are stronger. As a result, Mike and Amy have, uh, are leading an orphanage there with about 40 or 50 kids in the orphanage that they are rescuing, that they are saving. Many of us sponsor one of those children. If you haven't sponsored one of those kids and you'd like to sponsor one of those kids, come and talk to us. We can get you connected so you can sponsor one of those kids. Their most recent ministry is the Women's Crisis Center. And I am elated, I'm thrilled that beginning this month, we are, as a church, are supporting the Women's Crisis Center. We're paying a thousand bucks a month and we're covering all the costs of the Women's Crisis Center. The women in Burkina Faso are, 
often slaves to their husbands. They're slaves to those that are more powerful than they are. They're forced to do extreme manual labor. They are regularly abused. They're beaten while they're treated as sex slaves. And when they fail to please their husbands, they're kicked out, they're abandoned, and they're left to die. Mike and Amy are beginning to work with these ladies. Let me introduce you to three of them. There are three ladies right now in the Women's Crisis Center that I want to introduce you to today. The first is named Diane. I believe we have Diane's picture. Diane is a widow and a single mother. Her husband committed suicide several years ago, and with no other family, Diane was left alone, abandoned, no means of support. And without Mike and Amy in the Women's Crisis Center, she probably would not have made it long. Pauline is a young woman with no family at all. Without the Women's Crisis Center, she would be alone with no hope of a future. Yemba. Yemba is deaf. In Burkina Faso, having a handicap is debilitating. You are considered to have no value whatsoever. You have an inability to learn and are often hidden away out of embarrassment. These are the type of people to whom Solomon is referring. People who are oppressed. People who are abused. People who are forgotten. People who are neglected by society. Solomon says, man, I observed the oppressed. I saw their tears, and there was no one to comfort them. Solomon mentions a third injustice in the passage. He simply states, those who should have brought comfort demonstrate unconcern. If you notice in verse 1, once again, he said, I saw the tears of the oppressed with no one to comfort them. Those that had the ability, those that had the power, those that had the resources to bring comfort, to bring justice to the oppressed, failed to do so. They, they were so driven by their own greed. They were so driven by their own lives that they failed to see, they failed to experience the injustice around them. And as a result, they failed to help those that so desperately needed their help. Let me pause for a second and say, it's easy for us to do the same thing. Not that we're power hungry, but not that we're greedy. It's easy for us to have tunnel vision in our lives and to be so focused with what is transpiring in our lives that we fail to see those that are suffering around us. And we fail to be involved with those that are hurting, those that are abandoned, those that are neglected, those that need loved. Man, church, let me just say, that's what we have been called to do. That's who we are to reach out to the oppressed. It was Daniel Webster who said this. He said, justice is the ligament that holds civilized beings and nations together. Well, in Solomon's day, and quite frankly in our day as well, justice has a torn ligament. (laughs) And Solomon says, life is filled with injustice. Now, let me pause for a second because we've talked about all of these national things, and yet I would venture to say in a crowd this size today, there would be many of us who would say, hey, Brian, I get it. Because I haven't been treated fairly in my life. Maybe it was because of my background. Maybe it was because of my race. Maybe it was for a completely different reason. Brian, I get it. I understand what Solomon is talking about. We all do. Why? Life is filled with injustice. It was during Solomon's day, and it is during our day as well. Solomon brings out a second point, and I kind of want to camp here for just a few minutes because Solomon then demonstrates that injustice can lead to false conclusions. 
Uh, That was true during Solomon's day, and it's true during our day as well. Whenever we see all of the atrocities that are going on around us in the world, it's easy for us to arrive at some incorrect assumptions. There are several incorrect assumptions that are alluded to in the passage. The first and the most dangerous is this. God is not in control. Have you ever wondered about that? You see, you know, the terrorism that's taking place in the Middle, of e- in the Middle East. You've seen some of the genocide that, that has uh, been experienced around the world. And, and in your mind, you sit back and think, where in the world is God in all of this? Has God lost control? Is God up in heaven with his arms crossed? Has he turned his back to everybody? And it's easy for us to come to the conclusion and think God is not in control. Many people have erroneously come to that conclusion. It was the 18th century philosopher David Hume that made this statement that has kind of been the clarion call for those who do not believe in God. David Hume said, is God willing to prevent evil but not able? If so, he's impotent. He doesn't have power. Is he able but not willing? If so, he's malicious. If he is both able and willing, then God must be evil. That was the conclusion that David Hume reached. Why, if there's so much atrocities that are going on around the world and God is not doing anything about them, what's the problem? The problem must be with God. You see, when one views the world around us, it's easy to jump to such a conclusion. Where is God? Why isn't God doing anything about all the cruelties of life? Where does evil come from anyways? Those are questions that theologians have struggled with for years. Let let me just take just a moment and, and give a couple of answers there. Put on your thinking caps with me today. And let's kind of deal with this problem of evil, the existence of evil. In theological terms, it's called a theodicy. Where does evil come from? Follow me today. The first thing that I wrote in your notes is this, and and don't jump to an erroneous conclusion. Let me explain it. God is the ultimate cause of evil, but not the immediate cause of evil. Now, let let me explain what I mean. Today, we believe in the sovereignty of God. Because we believe in the sovereignty of God, we have to admit that God has allowed evil to enter into the world. When Satan fell, God allowed it. We might not understand, but God wasn't caught off guard. Whenever Satan fell, God wasn't like, oh my word, how did that happen? I didn't plan on that happening. God in his sovereignty allowed it. When Adam and Eve sinned, God, in his sovereignty, for some reason, permitted it. When sin happens, God is not caught off guard. Now follow me. Just because he allows it, though, doesn't mean that God is at fault. In giving man the freedom to make decisions, God also gave man the capacity to choose right from wrong. If not, we would have all been robots. You know, okay, God, what do you want me to do? Turn right. Okay, I'll turn right. Where do I go now? Okay, I go to church. I'm going to do all of that. God didn't want to have a world filled with robots. So, so, so God gave us the capacity to make decisions. With that capacity came the inherent possibility of man making wrong decisions. Thus, God gave uh, man the capacity to sin, the capacity to do evil. So we must say that although God is the ultimate cause, and I don't like the word cause, he is not the immediate cause. The immediate cause of evil is sin. I want you to see that in your notes. Evil and injustice are the direct results of man's sin. It is clear, and please understand, God did not create sin. God did not create it. He merely provided the options necessary for human freedom, options that could result in sin. Adam and Eve chose to sin. Let me pause for a second and say this. 
you choose to sin as well. Nobody puts a gun to your head and says, okay, Brian, lie right now, lie. Nobody puts a gun to your head and says, okay, Brian, think that impure thought right now. No, on those moments, I choose to sin when I'm given the option of doing right and wrong. For some reason, at times, my sinful nature pulls me in the wrong direction, and I sin. The, the cause of sin, or excuse me, the cause of evil is sin. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all have sinned. All right, evil and injustice are the direct result of man's sin. But I want you to catch this. This is the most important thing I might say all day long. Jesus became the greatest victim of evil so that we might become victors over evil. That is such an important point. No one can impugn the goodness of God for allowing sin, for he himself suffered more injustice than anyone who has ever lived. Jesus is a fellow sufferer with us. He who was perfect, who never sinned, who never told a lie, who never had a wicked thought, who never got mad at anybody, who never demonstrated any wrongdoing of any kind, experienced the injustices of this life. If anyone deserved to not experience those injustices, it was Jesus. Yet Jesus willingly came to earth and experienced the injustices of life. As a matter of fact, he took all of them upon himself. And he suffered for us. It was Paul who said it this way in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For God made Christ who never sinned to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He became the victim so that we might become the victors. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians 15, 57, but thank God who gives us the victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. So as we sit back and, and observe the atrocities of life, let's not jump to the conclusion that God is not in control. God is in control. And we'll see that in just a few moments in the passage. God eventually will provide justice. And Solomon talks about that. He mentions two other erroneous conclusions that I just want to mention briefly today. The second thing he says that is that humans are the same as animals. Notice in verse 19, he says this, for people and animals share the same fate. Now, I know that many of us in our congregation are animal lovers, and as much as I would like it to be true, Solomon is not saying that your pet is going to go to heaven with you. That's not what Solomon is saying in the passage, all right? I know you might want to talk about that and debate that with me afterward, but that's not what Solomon is saying in the passage. The idea that Solomon is promoting is an under-the-sun philosophy. If we are going to live like animals, then we most certainly will die like animals. The other thing that he says is this, the dead and the unborn are better off than the living. Chapter 4 and verse 2, for I concluded that the dead are better than the living. Here's what Solomon is saying. Who wants to live in a world where injustice prevails? Where, where the strong and the powerful oppress the weak? Now remember that Solomon is writing from an under the sun mentality. He says over and over again, this is under the sun. So he's writing as if he were a person that did not know that God existed. This isn't an above the sun mentality. It's an under the sun mentality. When one simply looks at life without looking towards heaven, life makes no sense whatsoever. You've experienced that, haven't you? You've experienced some of the atrocities of life, and without looking up to heaven, just seeing things from an eternal, from an earthly perspective, it makes no sense whatsoever. If our future is the grave, then why not just look out for yourself? If 
if this is all there is to life, then, then why not push yourself up on your neighbor's back? Why not live like an animal? Just eat, drink, and die. If this is all there is, life would be meaningless. Fortunately, though, you know, and I know that that is not the case. God is in charge. And because God is in charge, God, life makes perfect sense. So, man, I know that's been deep and philosophical today, but let me just answer the question as we end. How should believers respond to injustice? As you experience injustice in your life and you see injustice that is taking place around the world, how should we respond? A couple of truths that we pull from here. The first is this. You and I must trust God to be the dispenser of justice. That's so important. Trust God to be the dispenser of justice. God says this, remember? Vengeance is mine saith the Lord. Sometimes we like to take justice into our own hands as if we were living out west and we still had, you know, two six shooters on the side of our belt and, uh, and we're that, you know what, I'm going to take care of this. I'm not going to let somebody to walk all over me. I'm not going to let somebody treat me this way. I'm not going to let somebody else treat somebody else this way as if it was our job to incorrect all of the injustices of the world. It's not our job. God is the dispenser of justice. Think with me today, what would the world be like if we lived in a world in which justice was immediately handed out? Did you ever think about that? Because sometimes we see an injustice taking place and we're like, why did not God deal with that right away? I mean, I, I mean, right when that happens, why doesn't God deal with it? You know, uh, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth sort of world. If, if, if you stole, then you immediately lost something of equal value. Or if you mistreated someone, you were immediately mistreated by somebody else. Or if you took a life, then your life would immediately be taken. Now, now we sit back and our human nature is like, yeah, yeah, that would be a great world. I want to live in a world like that where, where justice is handed out immediately. But that would affect all of us. Not just the murderers and the thieves. Because none of us are perfect. So, so if you gossiped, maybe your tongue would turn green immediately. <laughs> or if you told a lie, your nose would grow just a little bit longer. Or if you had an impure thought, it would show up on your Facebook page and everybody would know what you thought. Aren't you glad that justice isn't handed out immediately? Aren't you glad today that God is the dispenser of justice? So why should we trust God in the midst of so much injustice? Verse 17 gives us the answer. Go back to chapter 3 and verse 17. Solomon said this, I said to myself, in due season, God will judge everyone, both good and and bad for all their deeds. Here's the simple truth. God will judge every person. No one is going to get away with anything. God is keeping an account. God knows what has taken place. Every person will stand before God. Paul said it this way in Romans 2, 6. God will judge everyone according to what they have done. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. As it appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. We sit back and we look at people who seemingly are getting away with the atrocities that they are committing. They are not getting away with anything. God is keeping the books. And Solomon says, in due season, the phrase in due season means this, in his time. Not in our time, but in his time, God will judge every person. And catch this, here's the, the next thing I wrote. God will always do what is right. Always. 
When Abraham was pleading with God not to destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, Abraham asked this question in Genesis 18, 25. Should not the judge of all the earth do what is right? And the answer is affirmative. Yes, God will always do what is right. Now be assured that God sees life through a different lens. He he sees things in the light of eternity. He doesn't see things as you and I see them. And what seemingly doesn't make sense to us makes sense to a perfect and holy God. But God will judge. And justice will be enacted. And so we should trust God. Whenever something happens in your life, you don't understand. Trust God. We sang about it today. Tis so sweet. What a great song. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Now, it's easy to trust when everything's right, when there's money in the bank, everybody's treating me the way I deserve, I'm friends with everybody. It's easy to trust Jesus then. It's difficult to trust Jesus when something happens that I don't understand. It's difficult to trust Jesus when I'm treated in a way that I don't feel like I deserve to be treated. But in those moments, learn to trust God. Trust in the sovereignty of God. Trust in the Lord with all of your hearts. Don't lean to your own understanding, your own way of looking in things. In all of your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. So how do we respond to the injustices of life? The answer is simple. Two words. Trust God. Would you say that with me today, church? Trust God. How do we respond to the injustices of life? We trust God. Whether we understand it, whether we don't understand it, whether we agree with it, whether we don't agree with it, whether we're appalled by it or shocked by it, we trust that there is a holy, righteous, perfect God who's in control of everything. And one day, everything's going to make sense to us. We trust God. Here's the second thing, and I'm done. A second thing, and I'm done. How do we as believers respond to injustice? Secondly, we allow God to use us to dispense care and comfort to those who are hurting. Those words of Solomon have, have rang in my mind all week long. There are oppressed people in tears, and there was no one to comfort them. I sit back and ask, where were the people of God? Where were God's people? If people are being oppressed, if they're hurting, if they're broken, where are God's people? Here's a couple of verses, Isaiah 117. Learn to do good, seek justice, help the oppressed, defend the cause of orphans, fight for the rights of widows. Man, that ought to be the battle cry of those of us who are believers. 1 John 3, 17 and 18, if anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love in words or tongue, but let us love with actions and truth. And if I can be lovingly blunt, not just about us, but about Christians around the world, we talk a good talk. We say that we love the Lord, and yet day after day and week after week, we drive right past those that have need, and we never think about helping them. And John says, if you have it, and you don't help someone else, how can the love of God be in you? Let's not just love in words or tongue. Let's love with actions. Let's love with truth. Let's be the hands. Let's be the heart of Jesus in our community. So how do we do that? Just a couple of practical applications. Number one, make sure that you are fair and just in your actions. Make sure you're fair and you're just. Avoid prejudices, realizing that in God's sight, We're all equal. I love that song that I used to sing as a little boy. Red and yellow, black and white, 
everyone's precious in his sight. How true is that? Have a broken heart for the poor, the orphan, the widow, the oppressed. Take food to the homeless in the streets of Hollywood. Support a needy child in Burkina Faso or Karai, Haiti. Open your home to a foster child. Realize that God has blessed you so that you can be a blessing to others. You see, God has saved us and transformed us for a purpose so that we can be light in a dark world, so that we can be love in an unloving world so that we can give comfort to those that are hurting, so that we can be the church that God has called us to be. Does injustice exist? It does. And it's going to exist as long as we're in a sinful world. There's going to be injustice until the just one comes back. And when the just one comes back and takes the throne, then justice will begin to prevail. But until then, there's going to be injustice. How do we respond? We trust God. We trust God. And we allow God to use us to be the dispensers of care and comfort and love to others. 